or Metallica. That would have been cool if I had played Fade to Black <laughs> instead of that one, right? Wherever I may roam. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, most of you are coming from OTP on target publications via the uh, emails and, um, and posts uh, on social media there. Thanks to Laurie. So a big thank you to her for sharing that information out. And then a, a, lot, of, a lot of you others come from our email list and from my social media as well. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I am really looking forward to sharing some great information with you. All of you have officially made this the highest registered and highest attended webinar that I've ever given uh, as far as a host goes. I was a part of uh, FAI and a part of um, AFS, the American or the Association of Fitness Studios, where they had, you know, 2000 people on. But as far as us hosting, uh, we have cleared 400. So that is a new personal record for us. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to share some really good info with you. I want to kind of talk about things for about 15 minutes. And then it's all going to be learned by demonstration. I'll be showing. Uh, I do work from home in our studio uh, gym here. And uh, my kids are right over there. You might hear some screaming. Our dog is right over here. We have contractors building the other uh, half of the gym. So we got some stuff going. So I hope you guys don't mind uh, the noise and some of the little distractions. Hopefully you won't even notice them as we go. Uh, but my goal today is to give you some actionable tools, some exercises that you can use immediately with your clientele, your aging individuals. So we're looking at quote unquote, the older adult as around ish 50 or in a biological aging pattern that has kind of now gotten to a point where recovery takes a little more time. Limitations are kind of a greater concern and we need to start kind of looking at, all right, we got to maybe change some things to keep you in the game. And, and that's the idea here. How can we still hit our major movement patterns, our major lifts that we want to address, but maybe just take a couple of things, curve it a little bit, edge it a little bit, and just make it you know a little smoother, a little more comfortable where we can still get very good return, very good results from it, but not have it be as impactful or as damaging on the body. So we're going to give you at least six. I got a bonus. I got a couple others that are um, kind of multi-tools. I'm going to show you a lot of good stuff. So please feel free to take notes. When we get done, we will be sending you the recording. So if you miss anything, you can watch that. And we'll be sending you this PDF. Uh, remind you in the PDF, the videos do not play. It's just uh, the pictures, but you guys will get a good idea. And if you ever want further info, trainingtheolderadult.com, you'll be able to see quite a bit of info there. Um, while I'm going here, gang, if you put anything in the q and I won't see it. Put everything in the chat for me. And if you have questions on a specific exercise, feel free to ask them during the talk, but reference what you're talking about regarding the pivot point press. Why do you put the strap here or something like that? So when I get to the end and I come through the q and I know what you're talking about. Okay. So why are we here? This is what we're talking about. Um, kind of the, the more common or the most common limitations that we're going to deal with. So when we look at a presentation like this or general idea of, um, delivering information to all of you fitness pros to say, hey, here's, here's info based on what we're kind of looking at these limitations and these percentages. With shoulder injuries, we're basically looking at the frozen shoulder. Okay, that is kind of the bigger concern, sprains, strains, some ligament issues, little things here and there, but we're not getting too structurally deep because now we're kind of threading into physical therapy and we'll need some physical therapy guidance. But what we're really addressing and the idea of progression to get to overhead is based on the idea that maybe the client just has limited range of motion, weakness, a frozen shoulder due to impact or improper use or no use. So that's kind of our, our, our comings to or where we're, we're addressing these lifts. The lower back, kind of the common throw out. Uh, you throw out your back. What's really happening here? You know, over abuse, typically it's kind of the, the QL QL strain or the erectors or something along those lines that are getting over abused and it will occur in improper lifts over and over and over and over. And then you're bending over in an improper position to pick up a sock or a, a kid or a bag of something, nothing heavy. Usually never like I was going for a PR and my back went out. It's always like the dryer lint sheets are the ones that get me or my throw pillows, <laughs> something that's like not macho. Uh, and then you'll throw your back out and you're tweaked for a few days. And then if you do that enough times, you end up herniating a disc, rupturing a disc, which I have experienced. Um, hips, we're talking about bone spur or any type of 
impingement kind of about the hip. This can be due to, uh, to, to bone and improper movement patterns. A lot of times we, we train improper movement patterns uh, via poor coaching, lack of coaching, somewhere along those lines. And you end up kind of grinding away at the hips and creating impingements, wearing away the acetabulum, wearing away the labrum. So all that kind of gets into therapy as well, but we're kind of looking at it as we got some impingement at the hip. We need to try to ease things up a little bit. Um, again, 30 at the time, 35 years old, I had three hip replacements. I did my right one. It went great. I did my left one. I was a little overconfident, a little cocky on my rehab. I'm going to get this shit. I'm going to, I'm going to get after it. This is going to be awesome. And ended up dislocating my hip. Um, the second day that I had it done, dislocation, uh, was relocated. And the second I went to stand up, it dislocated again. We did this seven times until they realized that the cup placement was in the wrong spot. And this all goes back to my history as a hammer thrower, a discus thrower, basically having a block leg and a follow through leg and developing muscular imbalances that don't allow my hips and my back and my legs to function evenly because of these billions of lifts and throws that I've done to create this asymmetry. Well, when you're knocked out, you know, the old saying, the anesthesia joke is everybody can do the splits under anesthesia. Well, it's kind of true, right? So when you're knocked out, everything lays straight and it's normal. So they put the cup in the wrong spot uh, for me anyhow. And when my muscular activation engaged to help me sit up, it just slid right out. It popped right out because of my, my hip alignment. So they had to redo the cup placement and change things a little bit. Uh, I had arthroscopies on both my hips. Both labrums were completely worn through. So if there's anything that I've had a lot of experience with, it's, it's the hip and the back or where the majority of my injuries and the majority of my focus as a professional and working with others kind of, kind of uh, encompasses or focuses on. So we got a lot going there. And then the knee, pretty much it's the meniscus tear. Uh, knock on wood, I haven't had any knee injuries to this, to this date. Uh, we have uh, some shoulder stuff going on right now. A lot of this is, I've experienced it. And once you kind of get that end, that, that oh, I've, now I've got a little more invested in this because it's happened to you or it's, it's, you've experienced it. You're a little bit more um, empathetic to your clients that are kind of going through the same thing instead of saying, ah, come on, let's power through this. It's not that bad. You're like, okay, I get it. That is pretty miserable. That's the point of this rigging that I'm going to show you or the manipulating of these lifts to kind of help. So here's some numbers that go, that go with this. Okay. So number one, frozen shoulders or shoulder injuries, sprains and strains, 50%. This is United States based. I couldn't find numbers worldwide. Um, without doing a ton of different research and, and, and addition. 50% <laughs> of America experiences on a yearly basis some kind of shoulder injury. That's a big number. 15% are chronic, and they do about 53,000 shoulder replacements each year, um, which was shocker. That was a big number for me. 53,000 is, is pretty high. When you look at the lower back, um, 31 million individuals every year in the U.S. experience lower back pain and or um, discomfort for multiple multiple amount of days where 15 million will experience chronic and long-term lower back pain the majority of them do not get it resolved it's really really bad uh, well it's good research but it's bad statistical support on the chronic lower back pain and getting people out of it almost always it's i think it was 70 80 percent of the folks always have to deal with something they're never healed or, or really filled up and then uh 300 000 um, discectomies each year, which is basically when one of the herniated disc ruptures and it's pushing on the nerve, they snip in there and they trim away all the rupture and then kind of carterize and burn everything back or they patch it depending on the procedure and try to stop all the symptoms. And this is where you'll hear sciatica, sciatic temptations and uh, signals and, and tingling down the legs into the feet. Uh, a lot of discomfort can come from that. Uh, the hips, 38% of America uh, has some kind of acute hip limitation or injury. 18% uh, um, have a chronic and 450,000 uh, hip replacements per year. And check this one out. 67% of America uh, has a, a knee injury every year, almost 30% chronic, almost 800,000 knee replacements. The knee replacement is obviously the most common, um, but doesn't rehab all that well for older pops. I'm talking 75 and up. They really, really struggle. And there's a commitment and a mindset. Are you going to work hard? Are you going to dive into this? Uh, where the younger individuals are a little bit more driven, a little more focused to get out there and make it happen. So 
some of the stats in there, you know, kind of go in. And again, these are all, this is from neurosurgery.com, just estimated research they kind of put in there from, from base numbers. It's kind of give us an idea why we need to address and think about these changes, think about some alterations to our training uh, because we're seeing all these patterns here. So I'm big. If you guys don't follow me on social media, uh, please do Instagram and Facebook. I'm very, very big on sarcopenia. This is our, our great effort this year is to pursue and defeat sarcopenia and we'll never defeat it. I know, but to educate and to teach people how to lift as efficiently as possible. And just to start, we call it EOD 20 every other day for 20 minutes. Just get a little bit of resistance training in your life. It can go a long way. All right. So exercise number one, I'm going to show you here. Uh, this is where the printouts will come in handy. We talk about this belt squat. This is something that I've kind of created as a, uh, a mock-up from a lever arm of a, this, these are rogue lever arms. All my equipment behind me is rogue. Everything, by the way, that I'm going to discuss today with you equipment-wise, I get zero financial return from any of these companies, I swear. Uh, you'll hear me talk about the Angle 90s. You'll hear me talk about rogue. It's because they're the best that I've found and the most efficient and the most durable and I speak to you in terms of, I don't want you to waste your money on having to go and buy other stuff. A lot of people ask me, why do you use this? What do you use this? It's because it's durable, because I pay for it once and it lasts. And that's what I want, okay? So anything I'm gonna showcase today to talk about with that, it's because of its durability and its high quality. I'm happy to pay more for something that'll last forever or, or a long time. All right, so this pivot point here, the levered arm, um, what we're looking for is to minimize or take away a lot of the vertical loading pressure on the spine by placing it basically around the hips. So though I've got limitations on both, my hips are pretty strong and pretty capable. My lower back is not. So the, the goblet squat, the back squat, front squat, anything where I'm really loading vertically overhead, I have to be very careful with. A lot of clients do too. We get little warning symbols here and there, little you know tingles here and there that say, you better be careful, you better change it. So this type of mechanic and this kind of lift really helps a lot. There's a counterweight to the pivot arm where you kind of get to sit against it. It's very, very comfortable. It's very quad and glute dominant. You get a great quad burn from it. It's one of my favorite pieces of this. It can be performed with a landmine. So I'm gonna show you both. I'm seeing my sun go away. It's getting dark on us here. You guys will see the storminess coming in as we go outside. And then I'm gonna show you how, for those with arthritis, and basically when I address this, I'm talking about hands, wrist, elbow, shoulder, and comfort to perform these. The angle 90s handle the absolute best on the market um, because i talk about them a lot and and they're the simon is the uh the creator of these is a friend of mine um he gives me a code it's linkle 10 if you have the desire to buy these you get 10 percent off and i swear to you i do not get that 10 percent. i promise i probably should everybody always says this you talk about them enough i just love their product guys um i've had three wrist surgeries and on one hand i have another one coming on my left years of lifting and throwing and cleans and all this, uh, tore me up, a carpal tunnel collapse, torn ligaments, Versailles, just all kinds of issues. And as soon as I got these handles, it really changed the way I could do things. And coming from our clients that have arthritis that can't grip and can't do, you think like just use a regular handle or any other handle. These are ergonomic, they're fatter in the middle, they're narrow on the end, so they're more comfortable to hold on to for those folks that can't get their hands gripped and closed up. And then I can attach them to almost anything. So you'll see this arthritis, arthritis uh, solution or an arthritic component to it by attaching these handles on there, we can address a lot. The pivot point, chest press, overhead press, and row. Okay, these are my faves. I do these weekly. Um, great way to reduce or at least minimize uh, how much pressure you're placing on the shoulder as opposed to like a bench press or a jammer. The, the hips actually counter the load, um, pushing into the wall. If you have a counter piece like I do on, on a 14 inch rack, or if you split your feet underneath, it would basically go to your rear leg. Um, you get to counter the pivot arm through the shoulders, through the counterweight of the hip. It's kind of a chest and tricep developer for the top. You're gonna get some deltoid in there too if you continue to go overhead. Back and bicep developer, obviously in the back. Very specific muscle groups that you can kind of target and address. I'm just speaking generally in your, your muscle movement patterns and, and groups. Can be performed with a barbell. However, the Swiss bar is a great arthritic component for your clients, wrist, shoulder, all these alignment issues. That, that neutral grip is great. And I will show you a piece of how you can use the angle 90 grips on a regular bar if you can't, if you don't have access to a Swiss bar and how uh, comfortable that can be. The seated high angle rows, the angle 90 grips as well. 
This high angle pulley is kind of a traction component to the back, so you really get to minimize or reduce the pressure on the spine, as opposed to like a bent over row or a seated cable row. Uh, this is a great traction stretch or, stre or re reaching component. We call it like a row your boat component where you actually give to the weight a little bit and then counter lean. You're looking at like mid thoracic, you know, kind of lower hip as a counterweight, uh, basically um, looking into a back and bicep developer, but um, an emphasis of like, there's a great line that Arnold has. Uh, he's doing bicep curls in the, in the squat rack, of course, and he's using, you know, a big squat bar. And somebody comes over and they say, I, I want to squat, you know, you're curling in here. And anyway, you're doing these curls, you're cheating, you're swinging, right? And he goes, I've got the 135 pounds. You have to cheat a little to make it hard on the other end. And what he's talking about, that's my best Arnold I got, guys. What he's talking about is he cheats a little. He uses the momentum to get the bar up, 135 pounds. And then he does like a five-second negative. So he's cheating to make it harder, right? Thank you, Emily. I appreciate the Arnold props. Thank you. So he, the point is in the row is I want to use a little bit of inertia. I want to cheat a little bit. I want to lean. I want to counter. I want to like heave the weight down and then slowly let that weight out. Not only am I kind of heaving more weight than I probably could strict, notice the band on the back. Okay, we call that a trail. That band does two things. The band kind of keeps it from swinging and going crazy, but it also adds a little progressive resistance, right? Or accommodating resistance. So if I cheat a little bit to heave it down, I'm taking all the pressure off my back. I get the counter lean basically like I'm rowing a boat and then I can benefit from that eccentric let out. Okay, that's a great piece that we can get a great benefit to us, okay, on the rowing component. Um, this one is fantastic. These are, are deloaded rack pulls. Um, I call it a rack pull, even though if I had the ability to, to actually set the bar down and like deload it for a second, that would be perfect. Where I'm talking about the deload is from the bands above and in the hinge, as we're coming down, the bands are going to reduce tension. And as you get, as I call more exposed or more vulnerable, deeper into your hinge, the weight does get lighter. As I come up out of the hinge and I'm getting into a more supported or a safe position, the bands loosen and I get to take more of the load. So I'm holding 45 pounds, or excuse me, uh, 95 pounds on the bar. At the bottom, it's probably like 65. At the top, it's probably like 90, 90, 95, right around where the bar, the bands are about to go, you know, kind of neutral. There's no counterweight. Basically, I'm just shifting through, through my, my hips as I would normally. Um, so there's not a lot of momentum to this one. Big on the hamstrings, the glutes, the erectors, the lower back. Uh, definitely can be and maybe should be performed with a hex bar if you have the option to be inside center mass. I always think that's a great way to go, especially with older populations. The more I can get rid of counter loading, which I mean by that is if you hold a kettlebell down and in front of you, the counterweight to that is up and behind, so between the shoulder blades. If I hold a weight in the front and a goblet, the counterweight is low on my back, right? So we want to always kind of look at counterweighting and see are we abusing or, or you know, overstressing people. Well, if I stand inside a center mass, inside a hex bar, I'm pretty much getting it right down the middle, right? As best I can. The ultimate hex bar would be a bar on each side and a bar in front and back. And then I truly would be centered mass and not side loaded. And then I'll show you how to add the angle 90s onto that as well. Um, this is a deloaded split squat, okay? I'm using fat bells and what we call drop set where I'm gonna do five, I'm gonna take that weight a little lighter, I'll go to the next, I'm gonna do five, a little lighter, five, and then without. But same idea, as I get more vulnerable or more exposed, deeper in flexion, I have the band plus some tension next to me to help me get out of the bottom, but I get the benefit from the load when I'm at the top. And so this is a way for us, you get people are like, why not just do it lighter weight and not use the band? Because I can't go all the way down maybe without that band. So now I'm training the range of motion. I'm training all the way through <laughs> as I'm recording this. It really was blowing me up. My legs were having it. Uh, you can train a deeper range of motion by deloading, by using that, that band. So I can get two, three inches lower than I normally would, but I also want the benefit of the load at the top of the range of motion when I'm stronger, right? So I'm kind of, I'm tweening, right? This is one of those tweener lifts where I'm bridging the gap. It's kind of helping me get up, but I'm still split squatting. I'm practicing my, up from the floor, my dynamic component, lunges and running, that kind of thing, okay? No counterweight, quad and glute developer, um, can be performed with, with regular super bands, not the short straps I'm gonna show you. You guys notice the, 
the uh, carabiner there in the middle. I have two short bands that are connected because it gives me more tension. And then uh, the angle 90 handle you can put on there or you can just hold the band. And then this guy, if you're gonna do swings with some clients, I think this is one of the best swings. Um, you'll notice the angle 90 handles are attached to the kettlebell. I like this longer lever. The one I'm gonna show you today just uses a regular kettlebell. The point is, can I put the band on and can the band force me into a counter displacement hinge? So basically it's teaching me to end up in the right position every time, no matter what, because the band is like, you're going here, you're going here. Now, if I can just keep my head and chest up and just work my hinge, work my pivot, think of yourself as a door and a door frame. The hips down, that's the door frame. The hips up, that's the door. Neither of them move, neither of them are flexible. The only thing that works is the hinge in the middle, right? So I just wanna break that hinge and go, break that hinge and go. Ham and glutes, big developer. I'm getting a momentum, I'm getting a carry forward, but before the follow through occurs, the band just stops it. And so I have to just constantly decelerate and, and engage and accept eccentric and then fire through and try to accelerate and come up. So it's a great lift. And then if you want some longer kind of tempoed components to it, you can add handles to two, three, four inches, just a little bit. It slows it down a little, makes a longer lever. It's a very good way to teach people, okay? Um, as we get up here and I get going, just a couple of things. If you have more questions or you would like to learn more about working with the older adults, trainingtheolderadult.com. We have something called TOA Select. We meet every Wednesday for the rest of the year. It's the whole year. Everything's library. I've got a library of exercises of all the continued education. We talk about business, programming, anatomy, online training, all of it's in there, equipment review. I do all mobilities. By the end of the year, you guys are gonna have 200 exercises library and categoried in there. Anything you can reference on, all instructions, archive videos, all kinds of great stuff. And then coming up February 9th is our online training, the older adult OTOA, and it teaches you exactly how we train older populations. It's online training is kind of a different service for older folks, um, especially if they're working 70s, 80s, somewhere in there. And um, number one, they really need it, but we got to take some different strategies on how to work with them. And we're going to teach you that whole thing. And just for being here with us today, you guys, we have a little promo code OTP-TOA. You might want to write that down. It'll also be in the printout and you get a little special gift, an extra presentation that I've done. All right. So let's head out to the floor. We are going to start with the uh, pivot points. Actually, let's start outside. I want to do that one first, just in case it starts raining. I want to get that one out of the way. So I'm going to unplug there and I'm taking you guys for a ride with me here. I got this guy set up. I got to get my belt on and we will prop open the doors here. There we go. Make sure nothing gets unplugged. All right. Hopefully you'll be able to see me out here. This is as far as I can take my computer because I have it hardwired to make sure you guys can, uh, keep a consistent internet connection. If I get too far on my Wi-Fi, I lose you guys. All right. So this we just had built not too long ago. I needed a pull-up bar. I needed a pivot. I needed somewhere where I could attach this. I can hook a landmine to it. I can hook a lot of stuff to this. But the key component to it is my deadlifting variation or my, my ability to create for me my deadlift. So I have a belt. Any variation of a belt will work as long as you guys have uh, like a, a dip belt or a toe belt. And then the, the pivot action here, the counter piece to this, and I'm gonna show you how we can do it with a landmine, okay? So if you don't have something like this to rig up, obviously not a lot of folks do, you can use just a regular old school landmine uh, barbell and I'll show you from there. But the kind of key point to this is, the weight now is distributed up and around uh, my hips. I'm gonna hook down into here work into position. I've taken all that vertical pressure off my spine. I've now loaded around the hip. I can counter sit, shift my weight back, sit against this load. I got, I don't know, 120 pounds on here and work a very comfortable range of motion for me a little bit deeper than I normally would because I can kind of sit back into the action, right? But I'm taking away that vertical tension. So that's a big one for me. This is a, uh, a tool that I kind of rigged up from these rogue pivot arms that they designed for people to uh, chest press and to row with, not necessarily to do deadlifts or this. And actually I'm, I'm hoping to have an opportunity to speak with rogue about developing something like this. 
because uh, if you guys follow Sornex, they have one. They have a very cool one. Uh, Bert Sorn and I threw a hammer together, not, not at the same school, but at the same time. And um, he has gone on to create some of the coolest fitness equipment um, that I've ever seen. And um, to see what he had there was kind of the inspiration for us trying to rig this up. I got to give credit where credit is due, but I absolutely love uh, that, um, that device. It's given me uh, a new lease on life, if you will, on creating uh, a deadlift variation or a loaded hinge for me from this vertical position. And what I mean by that is that I can do and perform um, hinges laying down. I can, I can bridge, I can do a lot of variations from there, but it's not the same as you guys know, deadlifting, squatting, it's just not the same. So this is a whole new thing for me that um, I really appreciate. And I just wanted to share with you guys. All right, let me get plugged back in here and make sure I'm still seeing everybody. Get my chat open. Okay. There we go. All right, everybody seeing me okay? Make sure that, that we're good. Emily, if somebody give me a little thumbs up, let me know we're good. All is well. Okay, all good, good. You guys have questions, throw them in the chat, okay? All right, so the, the in, in gym version, okay, the in gym version, meaning uh, you guys have landmines, you have a barbell, we have a general piece that we can use. I have my landmine set, handles of choice. We can take a dip belt and create over the top, or basically we can take uh, the leverage of the bar itself and take the pivot piece out of this, meaning that I get some forward pressure holding my handles and I can lever my hips against the lever of the landmine. Now, what I mean by that is two levered actions can work with each other, right? To, to create maybe a bigger range of motion, bigger fulcrum, and we can move more load in that. But when I get to lean against something, that's where I feel the support for my spine, for my back. So what I have on here, and I can show you guys a little zoom and close up here in a second. I have a collar on there that allows the handles that I'm holding onto where I can actually lean into the landmine. And once I lean forward and I feel contact, I can lean against that as I squat down. So more or less, if you're holding the landmine, it's like leaning into it to press, it kind of supports you. And it's the same action when deadlifting, you're just leaning on it on the bottom half, okay? So this is a fun one to try to work. You know, definitely try it yourself before you put it in front of a client. But this gives you a great chance, a great opportunity to work deeper ranges of motion, take away the vertical load, but sit into um, like a, a deeper range of, of triple flexion right, that you probably wouldn't be able to access all the time without creating some triggers. This has been another one of those kind of life-changing, life-altering exercises for me that's helped just a ton, okay? All right, next one, and I'm gonna make sure I have enough time to go through all these. Next one is our pulley row. So from the pulley, I like to use the pulleys as opposed to uh, bands. You notice I, I placed the, a note on there that you can use bands, okay? And then the nice thing about bands is you, they're, they're comfortable and they can work through good ranges of motion and uh, they're easy to attach in doors and racks and you can do it at home with clients. But where we really want to see um, our growth with our, our athletic clients as we go or the ones we want to push a little more is I need to have a consistent load to start with. I, I, when I feel the band, I'm like, okay, that's about 30 pounds. And when I double it, the chart says it goes to 60 pounds. I get that. But with this, I know this is 53 pounds. It's always 53 pounds. I can add some accommodating component to it. And I'm going to distribute that 53 pounds via one pulley and I can kind of work through this range, but the, the tension is pretty much always going to be the same. So uh, the, the modification or the big adjustment for working with the aging athlete is the high angle. We talked about that little traction or that release, if you will as you kind of hinge forward into the counter row, that's the big piece of this, where if the cable pulley is straight out like a seated row, even in a lat pull down the direct overhead, it does give you that traction and a little relief in the back, 
um, but we're, we're working with this overhead action that's a little bit more lat dominant. I'm really trying to target my rhomboid, my posterior delt, um, lower, you know, lower trap, like mid erectors in my back. I'm really trying to target that spot for our postural awareness and our, and our ability. That's like our, the, that mid thoracic cavity is like the base for all of our load carrying actions, you know, groceries and weights and whatever else that we do that this kind of center mass positions, like I really got to target that strength there. So this is a key row for us to address that. And when you feel a really good kind of tension to it, I'm engaging, but I get this little cheat, my little momentum where I come forward and this is the traction position here. The band's kind of pulling me up and forward and I get that relief in my back and then I'm gonna counter lean pull and then let it out nice and slow. Counter lean pull, let it out nice and slow. And let's say the load that I'm working with here, if I didn't do the counter lean and I just stayed here and just tried to do strict rows, let's say I can only do like eight, but I call for 12 with a little momentum and working that eccentric piece down, that's exactly the load that I'm, I'm looking for. So one of you had sent me an email and said, can you talk about how, how do you know that weight is good and how do you know if we should progress the weight? There's three things I'm looking for. Number one is, can you maintain the tempo that I'm asking for? If I ask for a three to one or a four to one, remember we always do eccentric first, right? So if it's four to one, that means a four second let out on the row and then a one second positive coming in. If I can keep that four to one tempo the whole way through, 10, 12 reps, whatever you're asking for, then we're looking okay there. The second one is, is the technique matching the tempo? which means, am I keeping my shoulders retracted to neutral? Am I working this row well? Am I, even with a little momentum, am I keeping my awareness and my posture and the position that, that I, the judge trainer, would say, that looks good? Or am I crunching the weight down? Am I just doing whatever, like just fucking, I just got whatever I gotta do to get it down there. Then we know it's probably a little heavy or I'm really fatiguing and maybe we should adjust it. And then the last one, I'm watching my client and their facial expressions and their ability. Are they turning bright red? Have we gone past red? Are they turning white? Or are they like whistling Dixie while they're going through just crushing it? So those are kind of the three things you're looking for. Technique must be sound. We have to hold standards, right? And that's where it's like the world of powerlifting and strongman and there's arguments about is okay to round your back. And remember what we're training for here. Yes, these individuals are a little more athletic, but we're training for like functional life. I'm not training for college scholarships and for millions of dollars on a team. Like we're just training them to be functional and healthy and feel good so they can go and do their athletic events, right? Or maybe move and just perform more athletically. So I don't need athletes, I need athletically minded folks to try to encourage these lifts to. So if I am gonna hold high standards on technique, I know that I'm gonna reduce their risk of injury in the weight room and increase their ability to trans, you know, transfer their strength, their power production, their reduced fall risk, their, their higher bone density, their lack of sarcopenia, like all of those health things are gonna go out there, okay? I get you for two or three hours a week, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bust my ass to make sure the technique that I'm giving you is the most sound and the best technique and the best lifts under the best tempo, under the controlled range, with the best technique, best, 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 with the best technique you can sound, because I know it's going to carry out to the world. And that's what we're being paid for. That's the job, right? It's not just give me 12 of these no matter what. If they're competing for powerlifting, if they're trying for something, then it's a little different, then I get it. Maybe, maybe technique can slide a little, because you're maximizing your one body's effort. But that's not what we're talking about here with the general pop who are just working a little more athletically. So we've got to find that technique, right? So that's when we're going through, especially something like this, where I'm going to use some momentum to help me. Every rep's got to look perfect. And the tempos are huge. Older folks benefit more from eccentric training than anybody else. Okay. And I'll tell you why eccentric training we know and is proven to tear in a good way the muscle fiber and challenge the muscle fiber and, and build strength and stronger binding sites. Than, than any other format of training. And who are the ones out there that need that the most? Stronger joints, stronger binding signs, and, pre, you know, and they need it quickly. So if I can do four to ones, four to one to ones, right? One second down, one second pause, and a four second negative coming out. Like these tempoed lifts, 
you can really get people strong, but they got to do it. You can't say four to one and every two seconds they're knocking one out. It's too heavy or they just don't care and they're not trying to do what you asked, right? You, you need to hold that standard. You got to, we got to lighten this up. You guys got to do the rep count. And when you do that, you can really come in and be like, all right, now I know every rep is going to take us five seconds because it's a four to one, right? And if I know it's going to take five seconds, then I know that we're going to do 10 of these. It's going to take a minute. And now I can program a little more efficiently with my time knowing that you are going to have um, these set, these set, um, let me undo this one, not the internet, good. Uh, that we have these, these set time frames, right? You're only doing 30 minute sessions or 50 minute sessions. We wanna make sure that we're staying on par for that stuff. All right, the pivot points. Let me make sure you guys can see me here from the side. I need a cameraman, right? Emily, I'm gonna hire you as my camera woman. You come out here and help me film these next time. Okay, the pivot point. Now in this 14 inch rack, okay, there's a little challenge for a bigger guy to get in and out of here. My clients typically, when we do this, I'll have them, you know, they'll stand here, I'll move it out, they'll step in, it's much easier. We have a Swiss bar. These straps that I'm using, if you guys have ring straps, you know, like uh, CrossFit muscle ups or inverted rows, TRX straps, anything like that, they're about $60, $70. I'll tell you the absolute best ones now are um, the, the Rogue, in my opinion, the Rogue straps for their, um, their, their wooden ring handled uh, straps. The, the name of this is escaping me. It's like they're, it's not the Echo, it's something like that. Anyway, these straps have every three inches, they have a, a, a welded, a sewn pocket. So you know exactly you're number one, you're number two, you're number seven. You can click them in exactly where you want them as opposed to the thumb press slide up, slide down, and you never know if they're even, right? So I love these guys. And basically you go onto the website and say, I wanna buy rings, I want black. And then when it says, what color rings do you want? You say none. And it takes off like 80 bucks because all I want are the straps, okay? And you can buy them that way. So that's how I got these. So I have these straps and a lot of gyms now, they already have these, right? Cause you're using them for ring rows and other stuff. And then you just put a regular old barbell in here. We can do this in any squat rack. You can do this from, I have other trainers that I mentor. They just put in heavy duty J hooks from studs in their ceiling or studs on the wall. And they can do it right from there. Squat rack works great because you can stand in like a split stance and then press. Or if you're in a, a 14 incher like I'm in, you can just sit into a little counter position and then we press from here. So I've got wide handles, a little more narrow, real narrow. I can adjust this wherever I want to. I can sit out into my counter position, butt against the wall, and I'm gonna perform my chest press version first. So this is gonna take place of my bench press, my push-ups. And the idea to this action, much easier on the shoulder, I can adjust with a neutral grip and a comfortable shoulder alignment, bicep tendon, deltoid pec, all this, the alignment components are really comfortable. You place your hands where you want to, right? Is I wanna take away that pronated wide stretch or pivot of the elbows, the independent control of two dumbbells that can be harder for, for folks to, to, to work with. It's, it's very difficult to manipulate two implements. So if we can reduce it to one, but I wanna be able to take away the stress of like dead start strength or bottom starts or like trying to, try to work with the, the lever, right? With the momentum. So the idea is I can swing this arm basically out and then control the 95 pounds on it coming back. Remember our eccentric tempos. Power it out, three, two, one. Power it out, three, two, one. So we could do that from a chest press position. Now, if I want to work more delt and try to get into an overhead, I'm just going to counter lean and reach further and then bring control my weight down, counterweight reach, bring down, good control. Again, using the leverage of my shoulder versus the leverage of the strap. Two levers work through a greater range of motion, greater weight, better supporting, and more benefit from. We reduce a lot of that, I don't wanna say like sheer force, but just kind of that like, that grinding, that pronated external, like that, that wide bench press piece. I've seen some of these barbells that have rotating handles in the center, so when you bench, you can kind of rotate. I've been rotating my bench press. I use fat bells for everything. Basically, it's a, a kettlebell, or excuse me, a, a hex bar for your wrist, right? Which I love, weight evenly distributed. Another Bert Soren and uh, Matt Thompson, I think, via the, the Thompson fat bell. 
uh, that designed those. And one of my greatest things, one of the greatest tools that I've been able to use, it's helped my hands a ton. But as I come down in my bench, I will rotate elbows in nice and tight. And as I'm pressing and returning out, I'll reach and rotate to pronation. And so I'll try to work 180 degrees of the bench, benefiting the kind of safe external rotation of the shoulder, elbows pinned in tight, my alignment position, maximizing at the bottom when I'm most vulnerable, deep flexion. And as I get stronger, 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 I can kind of work towards a more neutral or pronated shoulder position at the top. But I'm maximizing my load, I'm working through a good range, okay? So how can we make this guy a little harder, more work on the lockout, maybe recruit a little more momentum, but not add more load necessarily from the weight. That's when I can start taking my little extra mini bands here and hook them onto um, my, my extra little pins. And that's what I love about Sornex, Rogue, perform a lot of these racks, they come with so many options, so many attachments you can put on. I love little gadgets and gizmos. I love the accessories page is my favorite page when you go on there. So now as I contact, oh, it's a lot more work on the extension. And this guy is violently trying to return back, right? And I'm really having to resist that accommodating resistance bringing me back. So another tweener, not ready for another plate. Where else can I find this challenge, okay? I could work my body weight up a little higher too to start. So as I'm pushing up the pivot, there's more load pulling down on me. I don't have as much swing at the bottom. I have to support more of it up. So deeper conversations, I wanna make sure I get into it, but there are single arm versions of this for clients that have asymmetries, work into a, a, a regular barbell. You put your regular bar in here. If I have time at the end, I'll pop this out and show you guys real quick, but you just put a regular bar in. And the only problem is, is you're stuck in this pronated or supinated grip, which isn't super comfortable. So that's where the angle nineties would come in. You basically hook them to the bar and your hands go under the bar while the band hooks on. Again, I'll show you if I have a, a, an opportunity at the end and make sure I cover everything. All right, so we're gonna counter this and switch to the other side. Now, one of my favorite agonist antagonist pieces, I do, I did like a six week series of strength development on these, just these two where I would pivot point chest press, pivot point row, and then I would do some variation of a deadlift. And I did that every Tuesday for six weeks and I kind of built up and had really good results. I felt very strong, but my body started to anticipate, I think it was a mind over matter kind of a thing oh, you're gonna do these three lifts again. We need to change things up. So for me, it's like every four weeks, I had to really force myself at the end to start changing things. I love variety. I like, I, I, every day I'm like, I know I wanna hinge and I run a row. I know my actions, but which ones do I wanna do? How do I wanna fix it up, okay? So a good little counter position here. Remember we're countering through the hips, trying to take stress away from the back. And again, same idea here as I row, I'm eccentrically letting that sound out slow under control. Big pull, big heave in and let her out. Working this downhill eccentric release, right? Build up all this momentum, all this strength, let it out slow. You're controlling this, this runaway train. Like it's trying to just boom, slam back and you're letting her out. Really good control. We have orange bands, red bands, blue bands, right? We got all these different little minis. These guys are great if you haven't had a chance to use them. I, I ordered them by mistake the first time I ordered them, thinking they were the regular size, you know, 41 inch super bands or, or echo bands. These are the new echoes from Rogue. I love them, really comfortable in the hands. And uh, when I got them, I went, well, sh shit, like, what do I do with these? Because we don't do a whole lot of pulling from the floor. I don't need blue, you know, 60 pound tensions off the ground. So I started hooking them in here and doing single arm pull downs and single arm rows. And then we got this guy going and I started plugging them into there. You can get some really great pieces. And the reason I have this rigged up is for the split squats. I'm gonna show you here in just a few minutes. Like these, these give you good options and why not just use these? Cause it gives you instant tension now. There's not so much play. Sometimes I want immediate engagement, right? Short, engaged, tight. All right, with these guys, I wanted to show you the addition of the angles 90, okay? So arthritic issues, when I row, we pull, this hurts my wrist, or right at the end, I feel like my wrist is kinking. This is one of the perks or the benefits of adding these handles on, is that I can create rotation or create my hands, or excuse me, create my hand position and rotation wherever I want. So if I attach these on, 
I get a little extra range of motion, but I could just stay neutral as I'm rowing. I could go supinated the whole time. I could go pronated and wide the whole time. I could rotate as I go through it. Really, we're, we're talking about that term rigging or manipulating the left to accommodate my comfort. Right. If my wrist hurts and rotating bothers me, the pronated position, this is too wide. This is too narrow. Let's, let's find these tweeners, right? The in-betweens are, are gold when we get down to the point of like, I really need to be comfortable doing these lifts. When you put something comfortable in your client's hands, they are much more willing to try RDLs, swings, deadlifts when they have something comfortable and they're not holding on to, you know, a three and a half inch end of a sleeve of a bar that's cold and they can barely hang on to it and it keeps rolling and you're like, well, here, hold on to these nice comfortable grips. It's a whole different ball game, right? You get more buy-in basically is what I'm, I'm trying to get at. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears here to our deloaded rack pull. Really, it's a deloaded um, hinge, a deloaded de RDL. So give me just a second here to switch these guys over. Oops, I need, no, I can put that on first. And I'm gonna need, um, a couple of different ideas or mindsets when we go into this one. And, and the control really of the lift is what's most important. So I wanna make sure when I do this, that my clients know um, how to do their basic lifts, their basic RDL, that hinge component is comfortable for them. And they are gonna be able to handle a little bit of weight in their hands. The bar is not gonna startle them. We're going to get the benefit here of engaging this lift, but I'm going to deload it by adding my bands to the end. So I've got a 75 pound bar all together. I'm adding 60 pound bands at double length. Okay. So if they go all the way down to the floor, it'll be about 15 pounds at the bottom. Basically is what we're looking at 30 pounds of tension with each band. Okay. As I take the bar out, and I step back into my hinge position. I'm feeling my 75 pounds. The bands are almost slack. Okay, they're slack here. I've got a little bit of assistance here, not much. Setting my shoulders, I'm engaging. Coming down with a three, two, one. I'm gonna hinge as deep as I feel comfortable, meaning this is as far as my hamstrings will let me go. I could go deeper if I round my back or I tuck my butt or some poor technique, right? So right before, wherever I know, and you as the coach know, right at the top of the knee, that's as far as you can go. If you go any lower, we're gonna get vulnerable, right? Or more vulnerable, we're gonna risk injury. I'm gonna stop there. So I'm gonna hinge, stop, return. I can add a little shrug at the top if I want to. Hinge, stop, return when I come up. The reason I'm stopping, number one, is to take away momentum. I don't wanna come down and just slingshot the weight back up. That's not the point. I want to come down and engage and know that the depth of my hinge here is a good, you know, comfortable hinge position for me. I'm right at the break point. If I go a little bit deeper, I could get hurt or I could expose my back. So I'm working right to that line, but the weight got lighter, right? So as I got more exposed or more vulnerable, my weight went 65, 55, 45 pounds and then back 55, 65, 70. 55, 45 pounds, 55, 65, 70. And so you work through this benefit, okay? If I use just one weight, one solid weight all the way through it, I have 45 pounds down and up. There's no challenge at the top. I might feel okay at the bottom, but where am I getting my overload? Remember, we're constantly seeking overload. We're, we're seeking the said principle at all times with all lifts. That's the point of being here. I need a specific adaptation to occur. Well, where's my overload? In this case, it's at the top. Okay. And I can, my body goes, this is heavy. And then as I hinge and I'm now working through a little bit deeper range of motion, and I'm trying to work through here, I can get down to a load that I'm like, I can handle this. This is comfortable weight for me, but I'm going to get more benefit of load as I get into a better position. And this to me is a key for us. Okay. Cause as I get more mobile, which we know increased range of motions and such are going to occur in performing lifts under load, not static stretching, even dynamic stretching is great for mobility, but hasn't really proven a ton to show increases in range of motion that occurs while lifting weights, while moving through ranges of motion under load. That's why most bodybuilders are very, very flexible. 
They just don't look like it when they're moving around, right? I mean, Arnold and Franco and all those guys back in the day, Frank Zane, some of the most flexible people I've ever seen. You see somebody put 315 on their back and literally touch their butt to their ankles with their feet and their heels together. I mean, that's extremely flexible and they didn't round their backs out. Like it's, it's nuts, some of the lifting techniques that occurred. So increased range of motion can happen from here. I'm gonna challenge my bone density by working with that heavier load at the top, but I'm in my stronger position. My joint, my ligament, tendon engagement, all that tightness is all gonna benefit, right? Posterior chain gets to work through a good range and gets to emphasize a little lighter, a little tighter, a little less, a little more recruitment, okay? So I'm working a lot of good things. This hinge mechanic, the average person hinges 100 plus times a day, okay? And that's a lot from grabbing my shoes to kissing my kids goodbye to picking up my weights to putting my food down on the table. These are all hinges that we do. They're just not all with heavy weights in our hands, right? So that's a, a functional component that we get to train for. And we know it's probably the most common action, right? Rather other than our mouth doing this, right? It's the most functional action that we do. This is a great training piece for it. And your clients feel really comfortable because like at the top, they're like, okay, this is good. And as they go down, they feel it getting lighter. And they're like, wow, I can actually handle this. Like I can work with this load. And they feel confident. They feel good doing this action. So now when I give them a kettlebell or I give them some weight, they're okay, it's only 35 pounds. I was doing 75 over here. My body understands we've created an overload. This is light. I can move it. Well, I've increased this range of motion through training through it. I can handle this no problem, right? So this is a great like precursor. Work through these RDLs, okay? Or if you get a chance to deload it, I would show you guys a true rack pull, but I don't, I don't have a way to deload it, okay? Like a rack pull would look like this, okay? If I had it set up right, I would come down, I would deload the weight, re-engage, shrug. Hinge, deload the weight, come back, shrug. Because what I'm trying to do in a rack pull is unload the weight and take away my stretch reflex of my hamstrings, right? I'm taking away that like catapult stretch fire. I'm getting rid of that stretch reflex. I'm stopping the weight. I'm actually letting my muscle go, relax for a second. And then I'm dead starting engaging. So it's eccentric strength, pure strength eccentric strength, pure strength. There's no eccentric primer slingshot power production. We've taken that away. And, and those variations, right? They work great. I love to rack pull. I just don't have arms or safety catches on here that fit. I, I'm, I'm working on that. I just don't have ones. Normally there's a little lever arm that'll stick out here about a foot and you can adjust those, but I got all this other stuff in the way, hooking it to the wall where I can't have them on there, okay? So if you do them inside the catches, you just have to be perfect. It has to start a little low. You know, I want to work this range first. So basically this is a deloaded RDL or a deloaded rack pull if you can do it. Now where we're going with this, how we're going to make this work instead of fabricating some little arms, we're going to get um, D blocks and you can put D blocks on the floor and build up like three or four of them on each side. Basically a D block is, it looks like this. Okay. One of your little air X pads but it's super hard, durable material, whatever they make it out of, that you can drop Olympic lifting plates on, you can jump on, you can step on. They're like huge Lego pieces that you can put on top of each other and bring the floor up. So I could put four on each side and hinge and they would contact those. That would be my deload. And then I would come up and return. So now I would truly have a deloaded rack pull, which would be right up my alley. That's exactly what I'm looking for, okay? We just don't have them yet, they're super expensive. They're like $90 a pair, but they're worth it. Remember I said I'd rather buy, you know, once and have it. So we're saving up for something like that coming up here in the future. All right. So now we've kind of mastered that hinge, right? We've got that guy down. Now the most dynamic hinge that we do is a kettlebell swing short of a vertical toss, which we do. I love throwing sandballs and sandbells and kegs and whatever else we can toss. So uh, a keg is a... Um, a big loaded sandbag. It's a, it's like, it looks like a keg, but it's made out of mesh. I don't mean an actual like beer keg, <laughs> which would be cool with 70 year old clients. All right. Kettlebell band is anchored behind at, you know, ankle height. You want it low and I'll show you how to rig this up. You put the band through the kettlebell and then you pull the band over the top. Like you're pulling a hood off, right? You pull the hoodie back over the top and now it's laced on there. You don't have to worry about it popping off. Okay, one more time, you guys missed it. Take the band, put it through the kettlebell, grab it on the other side, and then just pull the hood back over the top, 
pull it down to the bottom and you're laced on there. You don't have to worry. I'm gonna do my proper pickup. I'm gonna step forward to tension, set up my shoulders, lock everything in. And then as I go to my hinge, you already see it pulling me back right where I wanna be. I start my RDLs, I get my tempo, counter, 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 counter. Hinge, return, hinge, return, hinge, return. Now, I am trying to create that eccentric stretch canapult. We've done pure strength, dead start. Now I want it to be dynamic, okay? This can be an orange band with a nine pound kettlebell. What I'm doing is I need the band to pull me into displacement. And if I'm working that door and door hinge, remember the mechanic we talked about earlier? If I'm doing that right, it will force me into a proper displaced hinge back. My, my eccentric load will occur in the hamstrings and the glutes. I'm compacting my chin, keeping everything neutral. I can fire that momentum forward and where a normal swing, any, any variation of a swing would occur, follow through would come out. And either belly button height is about where I like to stop, maybe a little lower. Or if you do full follow throughs and go all the way overhead, which I'm not a fan of, but people do them, I get it. That's gone. That follow through has stopped almost immediately. There is a follow through, there's a change of direction, but it's super quick and it's dynamic. So I'm trying to minimize follow through. So there's just constant tension. Think of it as like a, um, like a pendulum. Contact, 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 contact. There's not a whole lot of wait and re-engage, wait and re-engage. I wanna create this like pendulum bell effect. But the bell effect where a pendulum and a bell's even on each side, when I shift into displacement, all my momentum and mass goes down and back loading my hands. So I'm kind of forcing like a dynamic hinge action to occur, but I'm reducing a lot of the risk by taking away any of the follow through or the loss of, of contact with it. I'm always in contact with the implement, right? So I'm always with it. So you really get this like muscular dynamic, you know, like a, a, um, a an accelerated contact feeling that you get with this and it's fast and it's powerful and it's explosive, but I never get in a position to like, I have to wait or I can, you know, I can get like in a clean, you have the catch phase, you can catch in the wrong position in the snatch, catch overhead, you could catch in the wrong position. This guy, of course, you can get in the bad positions if you start to get lazy or fatigue. But in this guy, we're just reducing the opportunity by like taking away that follow through action and just forcing the constant prep, accelerate, prep, accelerate, prep. It just, it's this pendulum, right? And it works great. You talk about people that are like, you'll see them fall over a little bit to start. And then as soon as they get that rhythm down, they're like, oh, this is what it feels like. Because remember the point of the swing is to get the eccentric benefit of decelerating load. You guys can get that, right? Like that's the whole point of the swing. Point of the swing is if I drop something from the roof and you caught it and decelerated it and threw it back up to me, that's the whole idea of a kettlebell swing. Can I catch something? Can I decelerate it? Can I fully accelerate it safely and maybe explode and release that? This came from throwing poods over in Europe and Russia. A pood was like a, a kettlebell that had a little longer arm on it. And then the Americans got it and we started calling them puds. And that's what we would throw in the hammer, indoor training, you know, for, for, for weight throw, that kind of thing. It was like a, a, a cylinder with a rectangular handle welded to the top and you would throw it like you would throw a hammer. It would just, it would only go 40 feet. And so we could train, but indoors. And so the kettlebell and the swing and the variation, the whole, not, not the, like the origination of the kettlebell is Russian and from the forties or whatever it is. But I mean, like the action of the swing was to prepare to throw something. That's basically what it is. We're just taking away the release action and getting the benefit of decelerate, accelerate. So when you do this right, your hamstrings are like, D I never get a break. I'm either pulling through to accelerate or I'm eccentrically slowing it down. And when we want to benefit posterior chain and hip involvement, boom, like money right here. Entry, finisher, okay? Get strong, get dynamic, right? Develop strength, range of motion, get explosive, start getting ready to throw something. Because after this guy, we're going outside and I'm giving you something and you get to throw it and you get to let go. 
which is super fun. People love to throw shit. People love to slam things. They like, it's really fun. And you see this whole new level of aggression come out when people are like, mother, and they get to say, you see sweet old ladies turn red all of a sudden and they get to like, let it out. And it's super fun. It's awesome to watch it. And I'm like, I want to do it right now. You're making that look awesome. Like that's the whole, the whole component is like, let's get explosive and allow something to release, right? Because what else do we do in here where we get to let go of it? Can you guys think of anything? Clean, snatches, bench, all this. You, you never get to let go. When do you get to let go? We work on controlling weight constantly, but we never get to let go of it. And it's fun to throw stuff. You guys get space and you can teach people proper hinging mechanics on the floor, proper hinging mechanics, vertical, loading, vertical, increased range of motion, dynamic. Let them throw. It's a whole new world. Okay. It's a whole new world. When you're talking about developing athletic individuals that won't fall down, reducing fall risk, all that, let them throw stuff. Tell you guys, center of mass, spatial awareness, balance, coordination, react, and then throw it back at them and watch that react. You know, I'm kidding. But like that, that whole thing, like that develops athletic actions. And, and that's one of the goals that we have is like our component is a loaded carry. And then we have a hinge. And then there's somewhere in the middle of that, our release drills. And, and that's um, like the pinnacle. That's where you're really getting great return for what you're investing in, okay? People love to throw stuff, but there's a great benefit to it. Okay, I think I have just a split squat left. Make sure I covered all my, my bases here, and then we can do some Q&A. All right, so what I'm gonna use here for the split squat, one of the best things I have um, asked to get created here from Kiefer, our contractor, is to put this eye hook out in space. We had a, um, before this was our garage and we had just big support beams in here that we would hang, you know, all of our, we had skis and, you know, wedding dresses and whatever else up there, rifles, all of our stuff here. And um, I would just loop a strap and then hook our pulley up there. And he goes, hey, I can put, I can put like a, you know, couple of four by fours in there and like make this thing heavy duty where you could row hundreds of pounds. And I said, that'd be great. Cause you're inside the rack, you're kind of stuck in this frame. And if you go in there, um, no, you, nobody can use the rack anymore. So basically I've got an opportunity to have something uh, deload me or attach directly from above. And, um, and I don't have to take up the rack, right? And I can be free out in space. So one thing we can do is attach a regular super band like a 41 inch band you can do that that's great the problem with it is you're not going to get like direct tension right away until down here so i like to use these little super bands right the little minis i've got two of them so as soon as i engage i've got tension in return okay <laughs> my wife i just said we had our, kept our wedding dresses up there and she just wrote back one wedding dress <laughs> like there's not multiple <laughs> She's, she's accurate. Yep. There's one and there will only be one. I love you. All right. So I've got my band here. You're so awesome. Uh, I got my band and I got my tension and my goal is left foot back, left hand pushes down and I cue this as hand in my pocket. Okay. Right against my hip. I don't want it to pull out in front of me and then I lose control of it. Right. So keep it in here and I'm 240 pounds. So I'm in contact and I've got a little bit lighter. As I come down, I'm 220, I'm 210, 200, 190, and then I can come back up. So if I am not capable of split squatting all the way down, this is a great place to start because I can basically make myself lighter and start to develop the strength and the range of motion to come all the way down. And then once you kind of get to a point where you're like, okay, I can get down there. And what we consider down is I have my knee pad there. I want to be able to touch my knee to the pad. Never bang your knee to the floor. Spider breaks of the patella are awful to rehabilitate, awful. It's a whole story I'll go into. I've had two clients have this from ski accidents, terrible. And, and, but it's the same thing. They fell while they're skiing, their knee impacted the ground and it breaks like a spider web, okay? So I wanna just touch it to the floor and return. And then once we get to the point where we're like, okay, we can do this, right? I wanna start adding load, but I'm gonna keep my assistance. So I will take a bench or a box or whatever you can do, or you as the coach, okay, you can just hand it to them and you can set these guys up. And so I have descending weight, okay? I'm in my split, 
hand in my pocket. I've got my 20 pounder. I'm gonna do my five splits and then I'll deload a little bit, go a little lighter. I'll do my five splits. I'll go a little lighter. I'll do my five splits. I'll do just my body weight and just burn it out. And you can even do dynamic if you have someone where your feet leave the ground, okay? These guys where you do a little pop, that's if you've built people to the point where they can do that. And, and what this does is it allows a range of motion, a controlled assistance for balance because I get to hang onto the band and keep myself guided, right? As I go down, I can go heavy, a little lighter as I fatigue, a little lighter as I fatigue, body weight when I'm really fatigued. So my effort output and the load that I'm carrying are gonna meet in the middle and I can just go, I mean, what did I do? Like seven of those and I'm breathing. I'm in decent shape, <laughs> right? I promise I'm not coming off the, the couch. Um, it's, it's a gasser, number one. It builds great range of motion. It works on this balance coordination. You can set up different ipsilateral or contralateral strength engagements to support weight, hold weight, or engage the band, which is great for fall prevention stuff because we're so used to contralateral constantly, but most of our back injuries occur in ipsilateral reaches, okay? Same foot, same hand goes forward to pick up something, grab someone. We train contralateral in all of our lifts, all of our pulls, all of our presses with the landmines. So implementing ipsilateral loading, ipsilateral lineups, same foot, same hand forward, that kind of a thing. You're training for real life function, like we talked about. Long-term functional development, LTFD, right? My friend Rick Howard works with the NSCA on LTAD, long-term athletic development. And he talks about cradle to grave. But the world of sport looks at cradle to 28, maybe 35 if you're Tom Brady, 45, and then you're not an athlete anymore. We don't get to do athletic things anymore. So where did our long-term athletic development come from? I still wanna golf and pinochle and racquetball and whatever else, right? As you get older, tennis. So where's my athletic development? Well, at some point, athletic development transitions to functional development. I just wanna stay in the game, right? I just wanna keep the body going. I wanna be able to squat and get up and down from the floor and reach overhead. You know, we don't wanna to get to the point where we're losing that ability. We wanna keep that sporting action to it. So that's where these kinds of things come in, where we're trying to teach these actions and give modifications that allow improvements in ability and strength and stability and power production, range of motion, Spatial awareness, all of this, all of this is so beneficial for our folks, right? And it keeps them in the game. And if they haven't been able to do that, it can get them to the point where they're capable and able again. Um, my, my wife had to help me wipe my ass. She had to help me walk with a walker, walk with a cane. She had to dress me. She had to help bathe me. It's not a fun position to rely on someone else to take care of you. Okay. I had lung cancer. I had thyroid cancer. I had a massive surgery to have my lung taken out and I had ribs removed and my intercostals cut and my lat severed and still deal with pain from that today. It's been 13 years. Okay. Between that and my hip replacements and all my other experiences, she's had to take care of me so many times that you, you have this understanding mentally now of like what it would be to lose your independence. And when my clients come to me and they mention that, I get it, right? And if you haven't been there, it's hard to try to empathize and understand it. So not that, you know, increasing 10 pounds on your bench or two inches on your vert isn't important, but when you truly train someone that has dysfunction to function or that's enable to able, you are truly changing someone's life. You are truly having an impact in someone's life greater than you think and coming from someone who had to rely on somebody else, you know, and, and to gain my independence back and to be able to feel athletic again. It took me a decade guys. It took me a 10 years to get to the point where I'm like, I feel good about me again. You know, it took a long time to get there. Now imagine if you were 70 and that happens, you know, you're, you're not getting back into the game quickly. We need direction. We need educated people that can get the job done. 
that can draw the dots and connect this and get it done quick and efficiently with the right tools, the right process. Okay, so that's what today was about, is sharing some of that with you in hopes that uh, it will inspire um, thought, how you can manipulate a lift, how you can think outside the box. None of this is crazy or ridiculous to do. It, it's all purposeful. There's a why to everything. And if you can't answer why, don't have people do it. Well, it's hard, or I saw this on the CrossFit website. Leave it to that. Have a why. Everything that you put together has got to have a why. And if you're not able to answer that question, don't have people do it. Okay. All right. There's my soapbox for the day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I've run over my time. I am happy to stay on and answer. I see questions, so I'll stay on for a little bit and answer questions. I do have a call at two o'clock, or at uh, yeah, two o'clock that I need to get off to, but. Um, I'm more than happy to stay on here and chat with you. I hope that you go to the website, trainingtheolderadult.com. Please sign up for our newsletter. Uh, get on there. You'll see about OTOA. You'll see about our upcoming events that we have coming up. Um, we'll get the video on seven strategies for if you're trying to go back to training. Good. And as a gift that we have right now, signing up for the website right now, if you just go on there and when you... You go to training the older adult for the first time, you're new, it should pop up and say, sign up for the newsletter. And you'll see a little right at the top. You can click on it, click on that, and you get a, uh, a free seminar that I did on seven steps to work with lower back um, injury clients, how to, how to work with your clients who have lower back pain, seven strategies to help them through that. Uh, and you'll just get that emailed to you right away. And then um, if you guys have any pursuits, anything else that you want, method, OTOA, uh, power product. We've got all these great things coming up here in the next couple of months. Um, I would be more than happy to be an instructor to you for that. I would love the opportunity to earn uh, your business and your trust and being an educator to help you. Um, I've been there. I've experienced it. I'm still doing it. And I'm constantly in the pursuit of finding the most efficient way to do it. And I promise you that whenever I teach you something, it'll be the best way that you can do it to right now. Next year, it'll be different. That's why I don't pre-record anything. We do everything live because what I was doing two weeks ago is different than today. I'm always finding new ways to do things, seeking out new information to do that. All right. You guys got to go. Go ahead. I get it. Thank you. Uh, please check out the website and sign up. And then those that have questions, stick around. I'm going to move back to the bench over here and we can go through a couple of them. All right. Cool. Thank you, everybody. All right, let's get into here. Thank you from Long Beach. Awesome, great stuff. Thank you, Dan. Great alternatives, awesome, thank you. Where's my mouse? Come on, there we go. Love the web webinar. The more I watch, the more I understand, the bigger my toolbox gets. Good, awesome, Matt, thank you, bud. All right. Thank you for being real and humble. About, oh, thank you, Emily. You're always so sweet. I appreciate it, bud. Um, okay. The second most useful thing. Okay. So the angles 90 and the carabiners, I'll tell you what, the, the addition of carabiners into strength training should have happened a long time ago. And it's a, it's a, such a natural component because you think about like these people are trusting their lives to these ropes and what's attaching the ropes, these carabiners, right? So if I'm going to attach bands to it, like something I don't want to fray or to rub or anything like that, these carabiners are great and they can hold a ton of weight. Like the lightest ones, if it's not a keychain you put on that opens beer bottles, right? Even those hold like 150 pounds. Like the other ones hold 5,800 pounds, 12, I mean, there's, they're, they're great, great products for that. And if you're going to trust tension and straps and that kind of stuff to it, you got to load up, make sure you pick the right ones for sure. All right, when you're done, would you mind showing the pages of each exercise again? I would like to see them summary. Absolutely. And Emily, you're going to get it. I'll, I'll email them out to everybody too. I'll show you those in just a second. Um, can you zoom in the angle 90 setup on the landmine for the hinges? Yes, Joseph, give me just a second. I can move over on that. Could you show the landmine, please? Okay, lots of people asking for the landmine. So I'll go through that one. Um, I was going to say you should partner with Rogue. So it's funny. I, I have a call with them, so stay tuned. I don't want to say too much, but hopefully something awesome will come from that. We will see. Um, will the band not fall off the bell in the assisted swing? That's why you got to loop it, okay? If you don't loop it, push it through, loop it over the top, it will not, unless you 
turn the bell around and fold it inside out, that's the only way it's coming off, right? But if you just pull it over the top and leave it there, yeah, it'll pop off the back. So you gotta put it through the handle and then pull it back. Remember, you're taking the hood off, right? So pull it through, take the hood off, and it'll wrap right over the top and then you're hooked on there. Um, okay, we wanna see the pivot point. My Arnold impression was great. Okay, so we wanna see the landmine and we wanna see the pivot point from the side. I think that's good. All right, anybody else has questions, fire away now. I'll be able to um, answer a few here too. Let's move over to this guy. All right, so the landmine, I'll show you how I have it here. Okay, so see this guy, okay? I just put, and you can put as much weight as you want on here because we're behind it, right? So I just put the collar on here so I can get the forward pressure when I'm, when I'm shifting into that hinge. I take my angles 90. Remember the logos always have the curve in it that goes with your hand. So you loop like so, and then band, uh, the, the strap goes on the back side. So as I step up and I engage, I have forward pressure on the anchor, right? On the, the, um, the collar. So now as I'm hinging, I have that contact between the pressure of my forward hands and my forward pressure, but I'm in the right spot where I don't, I'm not leaning, right? I'm just right in the center. I have like a, a slight tension lean forward, the landmine tension pushing back to me just puts me right in the center. And those two pivot points coming together just allow me to lift and feel support. The counter leverage from here contacts and goes right through my hips basically. So once you're engaged and you like lock your arms in, like lock everything in and just engage it and then lift, return, lift, return. Remember we talked about the hinge, you know, in the door, that's it, okay? So real simple, whatever weight you want here, you can put big plates on there too. You'll be, you'll be behind it. Um, I just put the little ones on here so it's not, not so distracting and I can go deeper. Um, range of motion is a big thing for me now. So I wanna get more tens and they make 25s that are like that big, but even like a 10 pound big plate sits up, you know, whatever that is, eight and a half inches in diameter. So, um, yeah, all you need is a little collar on there, something to hold on to. Now, I'll run a strap around this and then hook it to my belt as well. And it's the same thing. In the one outside, we get to lean back. With this one, you lean forward. And so the, the strap, the loop will hook onto here. And as you lean, same idea as holding these guys, I can just hook it to my belt and counter from there. Very, very comfortable. Um, I would prefer that one outside, but you guys don't have the option to do that. This is a very close second, okay? All right, and then the barbell on the Swiss bar, or excuse me, the barbell on the pivot point. Um, let me show with this guy, I'll unhook these. And then I'll just show you guys without, without weight. Um, it doesn't really like sell the activation very much, but you'll get it. Okay, through like so, through like so. Okay, so just regular bar, right? Regular every bar in there. Get these guys going. Get my orange band. I could put on a plate or two if I want, and then I can hook my orange band on this side. Same thing here. Standing band. Okay, so I've got my tension. So now I could do pronated rows. I could flip my grip, supinated rows. I get to the other side and push. I can hook the angle 90s on and do my rotation. And then to show you the last one, which is the pivot point press with angle 90s. This is one that if you don't have bars, a Swiss bar, you can basically create a Swiss bar with a regular bar in these grips here. And it does take a second or two to rig it up but it's worth it. I appreciate you guys staying on here and going through this with me. All right, put that guy through. Okay, so same setup, everything I was just doing there, just like I was gonna have the Swiss bar set up, but now when I go into my counter, all I can do is pronate it, right? So where can I get my neutral pivot? So the angle 90 handles in, so I'm gonna go underneath it. And so now I can press from here and get that neutral action, right? 
clients really like this. It's very comfortable if I'm trying to create the Swiss bar push, but using a regular, regular barbell. I don't have Swiss bars and I know, I don't, I don't know if they're common enough where they're found in like every gym, you know, um, maybe in most, you know, kind of strength based or like powerlifting gyms, you're definitely going to see them. But all I need is a regular everyday bar, hook these guys on and you can adjust this to wherever you want in length and wherever you want in the rotation here. And it really creates a comfortable uh, opportunity for them. So try that out. If you get a chance, any other questions, fire away. I got a few more minutes. I'm happy to answer. Perfect. Makes sense now. Good. This is how very similar. I taught my Pilates tower classes. Okay. I've seen the towers. Yep. Give me more ideas. Good. Em. All right, gang. Thank you, everybody. You guys rock. I appreciate you. And um, anything else, feel free to um, check us out on the website. Send me an email on there. I appreciate you guys. Emily, I know you want to see the slides again. I'm going to PDF uh, email them to you here shortly. Okay. All right, gang. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. I love you guys. Bye-bye.